Great. I'm okay. I like those shoes. Yeah. Everything all right? Okay. Okay, good. All right, so um, it's Batman versus Superman, Dog yeah. Justice. Yeah. Woo! Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, three hours and two minutes. Of, <laughs> Glory? Oh, yes, very good. Glory. Um, so um, I'll be back after with a few guests, and we'll talk a little bit about what went into it. There's a couple things. It wasn't a documentary, so we had to make up a lot of it. Um, a lot of like, sets and things. There's no real bat caves, so we had to build them. So anyway, that'll be fun. So um, again, enjoy. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming out. Um, again, I'll thank you after, but thank you so much for coming out um, and uh, participating in this event uh, for an incredible cause. And uh, thank you so much. Um, but uh, we'll talk more after. So please enjoy Batman vs Superman. Off <laughs> On the logistics side, similar to for those of you that were here yesterday, when the credits start to roll, lights will come up. We're going to flip the room again, so it's a good time to run, use restrooms, step outside, take a break. And then we'll get into the Q&A. And then after the Q&A, we will bring, we'll do a lineup for the signing, and the signing will be in the lot. We'll flip that out there as well. So just know that when the movie ends, feel free to take a quick break, and then we'll get started with Q&A as quick as possible. tonight. This is the Trinity and Weta made this amazing um, Trinity sculpture and it's going to be going for sale now and 10% of the purchases of this weekend will be donated to AFSP. So if you would like to pre-order this, you can go to wetaworkshop.com QR code it. <laughs> Backslash shop. Jesus. So thank you. We're really excited Backslash. about this. Backslash. Backslash. Um, and without further ado, okay. we're going to introduce the panel and uh, yeah. get ready to do My this. My mic's not working. Okay, here. Yeah. All right. Bye. All right. Yeah, I guess. No, I'm not. Who's it? All right. Yeah, here you go. Yeah. <laughs> hey, everybody. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. My name is Sean O'Connell. I'm the managing editor at Cinema Blend, and I'm so delighted to be hosting this panel tonight. Um, starting with, we're going to introduce everybody who's here tonight, starting with Zack Snyder, filmmaker. Woo! Yeah, Larry's not feeling well. Larry was going to come. So let's all send out a vibe to Larry. Get better. Yes, yes. Mike feels like. Can you guys hear me? Am I looking good? We can hear you, but we're also at the front. That's true. Can you guys hear me back there? Show of hands in the back. All right, good. I know, I don't really need yeah. a mic, but it's fine. Give me that thing. <laughs> uh, we want to thank everybody, of course, anyway, who is cool. here live for the Q&A, and of course, everybody who is online via Vero. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I want to start with an easy one. Zach, is it true that uh, you discovered all of these guys through a hummus commercial? No. They were not. That, 
It could have been, but it wasn't. It was, uh, I discovered them through, well, Damon I've known forever. So Damon, uh, I think I discovered him through our mutual friend, Kirk Johnstad, who, you know, is uh, um, one of my writing partners I write with all the time. They were buddies, um, and uh, he came by, I mean, literally in uh, like 1992, I think it was, or 93, sometime, wasn't it? It was, uh, yeah, so you were, you were, you were I was six. Super Bowl spot. Yeah, I was, yeah, Super Bowl spot uh, for Budweiser, um, right? Yeah. yeah, so yeah, a long time ago. Who knows what Olympics it was? It was like the first Olympics. Um, so yeah, so that was, that's when I met Damon. And then DJ met, because um, of course we worked on, what he came in to say like, hey, what the fuck are you doing with this Watchmen thing? <laughs> 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 You're gonna fuck it up, I'm sure. And I was like, no, I'm gonna try not to. He's like, all right, we'll see. I'll do your movie. <laughs> and it wasn't that, it was, he wasn't that crusty, but it was cool, it was like. But then he ended up like, of course, being amazing and we became amazing friends and he's done everything with me since then. And then Patrick, of course, is the genius um, uh, production designer. Um, yeah. 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 He came in to do this movie and that stage through Justice League, you know, like, so, um, you know, great to have him. So thanks for coming out. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. So no hummus commercial, <laughs> though that is a great origin story as well. <laughs> uh, David, I would like to start with you. You are famously known, of course, for designing the warehouse fight scene, which I think everybody in this room would do. The best Batman sequence of all time. Um, I want to get yeah. your opinion on why you think that scene continues to resonate with audiences to this day. Well, uh, I would say that I'm a fan. There's a, there's a part inside me that I'm just an eight-year-old kid still, and thank God I found a career where I could continue to keep that side alive. Right. And that's just the way I always wanted to see Batman move, and obviously had this this gentleman to react. Really, yeah, let's go nuts. Yeah, thanks God you had the skill set to then make that happen. That's like a nice, that's a nice perfect storm of, because uh, it's one thing if someone's like, oh, it's cool. I'd love to see Batman fight in a cool way, but like Damon knows how to do that, so that's a good. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Thank you, and and an amazing team we have. Obviously, I, you know I keep uh, a lot of talented people around me to uh, that share the same passions, and you know likewise Zach's leading from the front always. So, um, it's just pure passion is what it was created out of, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's really flattering and humbling to see how people receive it to this day. There's something I want to follow up with you on because I saw this on Screen Rant um, that you, and I didn't know this until today, you play Joe Chill also in the yeah. beginning of the movie. You're the one who kills Martha. So in a way, you get to kill Martha Guilty and then eventually charge. save Martha. Yeah, that's weird, yeah. It is, is that odd. parallel intentional, Zach? Did you do, is that some meta thing that you did? Uh, no, but it's cool. Uh, <laughs> because I, I just was like, I like Damon in the movies. You know, I just like him in the movies. He's a good. He's really actually a good actor, and you know, he's um, always very humble. But like, I just like putting him in the movies. So I was like, oh, you should be Joe too. You should kill the Waynes. <laughs> and he was like, all right, fine, okay, I guess if I must. It was free. It's freezing. It was so cold. But uh, yeah, no, and it did a great job. Was yeah. that Chicago? It was Chicago, and it was the coldest time I've ever. Oh, it's yeah. so cold. Yeah, yeah, everyone behind camera literally had. They, they, you could see maybe their eyes. Yeah, we were on an Arctic parties. expedition and they were just like it, it normal was, uh, people. Like, and he was like in a leather jacket. <laughs> <laughs> well worth it, but uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a chilly evening. And, and then the, 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 yeah, all the cameras fucked up. So it was like, that's how <laughs> The warehouse used to be called the, uh, Martha Rescue, wasn't it? When you guys were working on it? Yeah, that's what we, in prep, that's just what we coined it. We'll right. give scene sequences just nicknames to understand what we're, what we're working on, et cetera. But yeah, March of Rescue is the- That's uh, one of the first things you guys shot, wasn't it? It, it, it literally was, I think, the very first thing. And like, we had this thing of starting movies with an action sequence. Like when we did Watchmen, we started with the comedian fight. Um, comedian fights um, Ozzy Mendeus in the in his apartment. Mm -hmm. And so we, it, it, we it, it was funny because production was always like, don't do that, you guys are gonna get so far behind on that and we were like no no we can we know we know what we're doing we're not gonna don't worry we're okay and but it was always good for all of us to get up to speed on with something like that because it's complex and it's a lot of um different departments having to work together and you know it gives everyone a chance to kind of 
feel each other out, see how it's going to be, and it, it always, it, to me, it's always like a great way to start. And we didn't, we didn't get by. You know, we we did, we actually did our jobs correctly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it takes the edge off a little bit to get one of those in the can. All yeah, right, sweet. Let's go. Builds momentum, right? And there's always cool shots you do, so everyone's like, "Oh, that was cool!" And you get, it, you know, it's, it gets you psyched up. It's yeah. not like, "Oh, we shot the scene where they like blah 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 whatever." You know, it's not as <laughs> it's not as fun. You know, it's not like, "Oh, Batman just came through the roof and started killing guys." Okay, that's great. <laughs> like, now, you, now we're into it. Do you edit while you shoot? Edit while I shoot. I mean, you know, normally we run editorial runs alongside the movie, so you know you can go up and I can go up and look at. You know an assembly of the thing to see if it's working but um we don't really rely on the cut of the movie to say like oh did we get everything we need mm -hmm. every now and then like you know with um Dodie, who i'm working with now she's really fast super fast and will send me a text that says like you know do you uh do you think we need a shot of blah 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 and i'll like and then they'll send me the sequence on my phone i'm like oh no it's okay or or yeah fuck you right um, so yeah, but but I think in that case we had a lot of coverage and we were, and the previous was so good. So we we were just trying to get what those guys could like lay down. Gotcha. Um, DJ, obviously this movie focuses heavily on the formation of the Trinity, uh, which we know is going to be incredibly important. But I think it gets overlooked how the work that you did in visual effects on the other Justice League characters that we meet in this film are it really ends up becoming the blueprint for how they are presented in later films. Uh, it's brief, but I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the process of coming up with how you're going to show the different powers of, of say, Flash and Cyborg and Aquaman. Uh, Aquaman. 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 Which one was the challenge, right and, and which one came together first? Yeah. Is it working now? No. no. And if you can answer in Larry Fong's voice, I would appreciate it. I will. It. You can <laughs> take mine in the meantime. That's okay, Wes, 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 Oh, you don't get a microphone. Yeah. 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 Talk like I'll Zach. Know. Yeah, I'll feed you the lines. Wes, you can tell everybody. Wes, 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 that was the, those pre-production days. Yeah, that literally, was the that very, was the very, first very, very first thing, thing we shot, shot right? right? Okay. And the yeah. main thing I remember about that was it was sponsored by Doritos, and somehow the visual <laughs> effects department ended up with bags of Doritos around forever. <laughs> which was cool. That's good uh, for you guys. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> um, but we didn't really have to do much to develop him because that was just lightning flashes at the time. We didn't really nail him down till Justice League. Right. Yeah, the only tricky thing was that weird milk, him holding the milk container. Yeah, we had to milk, like, right. figure out if he could like... Yeah. It drops a teeny bit. Well, the milk container was CG. That was the thing. Yeah, he had it because he had to go and come back, and it had to he had to catch it before it dropped. And then Aquaman, we Aquaman proved our dry for wet theory because we shot it. Wet we shot it wet. wet. It was yeah, and it was a pain in the ass. It was the worst. Like, forget it. <laughs> it's the we'll worst never thing do a whole movie like that. I remember we were like, oh yeah, let's just shoot it under water. That's <laughs> yeah. so cool. Yeah, yeah. And we were like, that is not cool. Yeah. <laughs> that is not cool. <laughs> we shot it like in a weird swimming pool in like in yeah. Detroit, like in this weird. I remember like also when Jason showed up. Remember like he was. Oh, we had to put all the tattoos on him, remember? Yeah, and he was like that's right. basically half naked and everyone was like participating. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly everybody showed up to want to put on the like tattoos. I was like, where were you guys like five minutes ago? <laughs> <laughs> they were like, oh, I'll help. I was like, oh, really? Okay. Yeah, so I, yeah. Remember, I remember that. But it was such a weird, we had like, like green screen in the pool. Yes, and it was like, we yeah. Did. Yeah. It was not. And then we vowed never to do it again. Yeah. Yeah. That was a mistake. And then Cyborg, well, Cyborg was. Very weird, right? Because you had a design for the whole lab, mm -hmm. but we could only put the set, the, the dressing in, right? That's right. Not exactly. the far background yeah, stuff yeah, yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that was like a weird green screen thing too. Yeah. So we shot where did we we shot that here, didn't we? Oh, we did shoot yeah. that here, right? Yeah, yeah. Weird, not like, here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right yeah. when we got back. Yeah, it was like by the airport. Remember? Yeah, yeah. I do remember. Yeah. Yeah. and then we right, right. But it was cool in Justice League because then we had to recreate that yeah. thing only like in a real giant set, like in a real lab. So that was kind of fun that to cool. to like retroactively then actually right. build a thing that we hadn't built. Right. That was cool. Yeah. All right, I want to stay on. But we did. Oh, sorry. Okay. Didn't mean to stop on that. But <laughs> I, what I remember about Aquaman was that's where we came up with the 
what do we call it? Uh, the hydrokinetic movement. Oh, right, that's because, right. Because we're like, well, when he has to leave this thing in the wide shot from the robot camera, should he be like, yeah, we didn't want him going like, so that was when we said he's just going to be like superman he's just going to go because he can control that yeah and that was that set the tone for everything yeah hydrokinetic hydrokinetic oh you guys know this shit there was so much curiosity in the fan base of just like how is this going to look especially aquaman and the way that he moved through and before really, before you saw him before or we saw him. yes before we saw him. we <laughs> also were curious. yeah we were <laughs> we were part <laughs> we were aquaman <laughs> curious <laughs> you so was everybody else yeah. apparently <laughs> to this day yeah you finally put that clip up on vero which was um jason swimming up to uh the throne i believe I think it was when you were probably oh, the yeah. yeah, that was cool. Yeah, that I put, was the first thing we shot for Justice League. Yeah, yeah, right? that yeah, and remember, it was like one of the first shots we got back. Yeah, remember, I filmed it off the. I, I remember you filming it in yeah. Verona, and I were looking at each other like, "What's he doing?" Like, like, <laughs> like, we signed a thing not to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I never signed that. Exactly. <laughs> I never signed that. <laughs> I don't care what the lawyers say. <laughs> Yeah. All right, I want to stay on Ezra because we have a question that came in from Vero, and thank you very much, guys, for submitting your questions. Um, this one says, uh, The Flash in the Batcave telling Bruce that Lois is the key is one of my favorite scenes ever. Would we at any point have seen the other side of that, seeing the scene from the Flash's perspective? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the whole thing was that we would... Well, I guess we were talking about it just a minute ago, that the idea was that in... <clears throat> Whatever Justice League that would have been, Justice League 2, I guess, you would have seen a scene, there was a scene where they were getting ready to, um, Flash was getting ready to go back in time, and the idea was that he said to Bruce, no, Bruce said to him, like, that there were two possible windows in which he could jump back through time, and Bruce said, well, which one would you have gone through if I didn't say anything? And he said, well, we were going to go through this one. He said, don't go through that one. Because you went through it, it didn't work. I said, you can't, you can't. So go through the other one. So you would have seen that, right? So then he would have gone to the correct moment. And he had to tell him something that would make him believe. Yeah, and he would have had to tell him yeah, something, yeah. 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 Which at that time was that in the other reality was that the child, of Lois Lane's child was his. Right. That's what he told Bruce make him believe that he was really from the future. <laughs> yeah, it's getting, getting so good. Yeah. <laughs> we need a chart. We need some of those. We need a chart. We need it some exists. of those. The chart exists. Yeah, it's like this. Exists. It's, it's, am I wearing it? Yeah, it's you might this, be. You might shirt. be wearing it. Yeah, you it's are wearing it. It's on this shirt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, it's on there. Yeah. Uh, along those lines, um, this is also submitted by Vero. Thank you very much, guys, for sending it in. Uh, Zach, during the Pizza Film School recently, you mentioned that Chris Terrio had a bag of post-it notes. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give us an idea or reference from those notes that you really wanted to use or just loved but couldn't for some reason? Oh, my God. Oh, there's so many. Uh, but I, you know what? Off the top of my head, I can't think of any post-it note. It was like a gem that we just couldn't use. I feel like we really tried to shoehorn all the notes, the post-it notes into the movie. And by the way, I couldn't decipher the post-it notes anyway. So <laughs> he, you know, he was, it was really his domain and his like secret filing system that kept him, you know, the perfect amount of mystery, you know, so that there was no, that there's no way we could get rid of him. Because he was like <laughs> the arbiter of all those. Post it down. So yes, um, I don't know, but you know, tomorrow you can ask him, or we can ask him if he if he shows up. Uh, oh tease. yeah, what? Little tease. <laughs> <laughs> Any Terrio fans in the audience? Yeah. 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 Uh, because this this film introduces Batman in the entire corner of Batman in the universe in a way that we have never seen before. Um, and so, if you could talk a bit about your inspirations for 
his bat cave in particular and how it reflects his personality um, and even this iteration of the Batmobile, which I'm going to assume is not his first, the way that he's constantly innovating. Exactly. Uh, so it started with a. <laughs> doesn't work. Uh, yes. 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 He's a different guy. He's a bigger guy. He's an older guy. He's bald. That kind of thing. All those things sort of got me going. And uh, so, so there's a simplicity in the shape of the Batcave. I didn't want it to be ornamental, based on my discussion with Zach, and he had to be bold, simple, and also everything should be hanging. The concept of the bat, to me, was important to have everything sort of hanging. Like uh, even the bat wing was hanging. The the car when the wind the, the windows open are like bat wings, the, the theme of bat, I mean, even, even the lab, even the lab was, uh, <laughs> sorry, even the lab was, uh, the lab was like all suspended. So this idea, the concept of the bat was very prominent, at least in my head, and we, we showed stuff to Zach and he seemed to have reacted to that. Other than that, it's bold and strong and no ornamental uh, pieces. And I felt that made it different. I felt like that bat cape was not trying to be pretty, it was just practical. It was not meant, to, he hadn't carved the cave to build his cave. The cave was there, he built his, his building in it, uh, filling that cave. There was a sense that like, he didn't transform something, he just built it. Mm -hmm. And also there's a sense, a sense of very modular. You, part of, you talk about someone that keep building things, probably it was not the first Batmobile, probably not, but even the Batcave looks like it could be augmented, diminished, changed. It was kind of the idea. So this is all based on a 10 minute talk with Zach. And <laughs> Wait. I mean, I, I gotta say, you know, you, you sometimes spend time with uh, directors and uh, there's a long explanation about things. And sometimes someone you sit with is gonna tell you five words and those five words are gonna give you the essence mm -hmm. of what he's got in his head. So after that, it's your job to kind of develop. But that was enough for me to go somewhere after this week. Uh, Patrick, one additional character I'd love you to elaborate on is uh, Lex. This is a totally different version of Lex. It's a younger version of Lex. Um, what were some of the inspirations that Zach maybe spoke to you so you can form Lex Core and then how would he need to be presented? I mean, Zach, you, you, you got, told me a couple of things about interesting, but the, the Google vibe, this kind, of, this kind of a new generation of like, you know, the modern, um, you know, uh, multimedia kind of characters. So that's kind of where we went with this. The, the, I, li I like one thing that Zach wanted to see is like the, the beginning, the entrance of this building was made of like playful games and, and little areas which you see on those modern companies. And that was kind of the vibe for him. Uh, that's kind of where we went with this. And then we also had that old, we that little nostalgic old LexCorp Neon sign in the basketball by the that's basketball right. court. Yeah, that I, I really always like that. That, that old sign, like, that's oh, that's where we started, or <laughs> dad, or whatever. We, the basketball yeah. court, yeah, on the yeah. back of it. Yeah, I mean, it, it sort of fits the character. That was kind of what was, you know, it came up, and there was this character that was very strong, and you knew this, this kind of the world he would be living in, and you know. And uh, this one, we had a few little things like throughout me all the time, you know, about what he wanted to see about, you know, the game place, you know, and then there's this whole high tech lab on the side. And also interesting is where we shot this thing, you know. Yeah. Can I say that this place, you know, we're in Detroit, we're in, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> you know, we, we, we found a location that was very inspiring, I think. Like, don't you think? I mean, that we was like across the street from our studio, and yeah. it was like this abandoned um, automotive, I don't know what, I think it was Ford. It was Ford. Yeah. It was Ford, yeah. like uh, distribution, it was a parts distribution yeah. office. It was like, an incredibly, it was a big building. It wasn't like a small affair, and we, uh, yeah, we were able to use it and really that. build onto it. It's cool. Yeah, it was a big, it was a beautiful lobby. Actually, we really did use Detroit for Detroit. I mean, Detroit was really the basis of Gotham. Yeah. Right? I mean, you know, the, the fact that buildings are scattered, they're not. If some of them have been torn apart, and you got them like scattered around, not like the typical city, it was a great place for us to kind of build the city. And you augment it in CG as well. So I felt. What? Yeah, you did. <laughs> oh, I thought you did that. No, we didn't do anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> I did. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Larry Fong. <laughs> Larry. That's what he meant. That's what he meant. So. Uh, Damon, there's a, a ton of uh, work being now uh, being done now by directors uh, that work hand in hand with their stunt collaborators. With in the John Wick franchise, you see uh, guys like David Leach and. 
uh, Chess, the housekeeper, pushing that through. I, I don't hear a ton about how much Zach interacts with the stunt team. I um, don't. I hate the stunt <laughs> team. <laughs> He's very cruel. Yeah. He's very cold. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I guess how much freedom does he give you to come up with what you want to come up with? Uh, and how much input is he giving you along the way in the process? Uh, tremendous freedom, but we've always met early on in early production. Zach and I will meet and concept design and just discuss. Uh, and that's really where we get our outline in our brains and in, in the texture of what he's desiring, and you know we just kind of play with concepts there. Then I get a team of guys and start to create walkthroughs, structures, just skeletons. Mm -hmm. He can oversee those and go, yes, keep that, change that, I love it, go nuts now. And then then he just let this go to into the petri dish and go a little crazy. Yeah, because like all the guy, I mean like. These guys that we've worked with over the years, these these, I mean, these are like, you know, our our friends. Like I see them all in every movie, the same group of guys. You know, it's like not. I mean, it's literally. I mean, Rich is in every single movie I've made. <laughs> like literally, he's like he literally made it through every single movie. He's like a. I don't know what kind of a black belt you get for that, but it's like a lot of it's, it's a lot of stripes on it. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, yeah. I mean, the stunt guys are really important to me. Um, Zach, I want to ask you about this because you do something in BBS uh, that you eventually do in Justice League as well too, which is that you open essentially uh, on a scene that was pivotal from the previous movie. Uh, the idea to well, you show it to us from a different point of view. The idea to put. Uh, Bruce on the ground in Metropolis during the invasion, the idea of showing a Superman scream opening the mother boxes. I'm curious if there's a deeper narrative uh, backing behind that that you want to start in a way that kind of bridged the previous film, or it's just that coincidence the way that those two have, have opened? I guess for me it's just because the stories are so intertwined, it's just important to catch you up on what's happening specifically in the moment you just left, you know, and that, you know, I think by backtracking a teeny bit or overlapping, it allows the continuity of the story to continue. And I think that really that that was the main that's the main reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, in BBS in this movie, you know, you have a there's a real cyclical nature to the film. Starts with a casket, ends with a casket. It's very there's a very you know it's very much a, a circular kind of affair, but it does lead into Justice League. And it does come from uh, Superman, so it's a, that's also that was also really important to me. So. Gotcha. And then um, before we turn it over to you guys in the audience, I have one more I wanted to ask about. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, it's clear that the Ultimate Edition of BBS is the definitive version. I don't think there's anybody here that would disagree. I mean, you hear from virtually every fan that they prefer it over the theatrical cut, and most say that it's a different movie because of the way that it plays. Um, if I'm being completely candid with you, I connected with the Ultimate Edition more than I did the theatrical cut. That's fine. And I wanted to ask you <laughs> if it's challenging to know that like the first step into the world of a story that you worked on is a version that might not be the, the Ultimate Edition, might not be the best one to put out there. I, look, the truth, is, the truth <laughs> is that I have, you know, you would think by now um, that people would know that I have a certain relationship with the director's cuts of my movies mm -hmm. and my relationship to the marketplace and how that, you know, I think if analyzed in retrospect over the course of my career, you can kind of see a bit of a pattern developing. <laughs> and so, and maybe by the time it reached BBS, people kind of, you know, mainstream pop culture hadn't really come around to or understood how that that concept works with me and i think that i'm okay with it because i understand um that you know movies are expensive and you have to they are on one hand this incredible vision of like what you think is cool and all that stuff but on the other hand they're a product that someone paid you a lot of money to make. Mm -hmm. So there's a balance there, and we all understand that you know you have to, you know, they own the movie in the end, right? Mm -hmm. It's their movie, it's their IP, it's everything, but and we're just kind of, you know, we're stealing it a little bit to make our movie. And so you have to, that balance is, is delicate. And so I guess for me, that 
this version of the movie exists at all is what I is what I'm happy about. Right? Yeah. 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 I don't know. Questions from the audience, I believe we have people with microphones who can come around to. They might not work. Oh, we got one. This this lady up front was the first one to put her hand up. I, I swear, so I'm gonna go with her. But I'm definitely gonna She's get people all the way to that. <laughs> so. Um, I love all of the panelists here, but I, I would have loved it if you had also had Chris here because this question is kind of for the two of you. Chris Terrio. Uh, yes, Chris Terrio. So, yeah, yeah, I will anyway. be here tomorrow. Oh, you're not but... coming tomorrow. Okay, well, I'll, I'll relate it to him then. But uh, oh, I would be really interested to know more about the creative collaboration between the two of you as it applies to the political intrigue oh, yeah. of this story because it's so pervasive and multifaceted. Uh, false flag operations, retaliation against whistleblowers, and in particular, the use of a false testimony as a propaganda tool to fan the flames of conflict. In this case, it's between two superheroes and not two countries or political forces. Um, but it really, it conjures historical memories of things like the Nayira testimony in 1990 for the Gulf War, and you know, Colin Powell with the WMDs. So if you could offer, you know, as much time as you're able to give to this really big topic, because it's, it's really interesting and it's such a unique way to tell a superhero story that like none of these other superhero stories are going there, but you two went there. Yeah, yeah, we, we were really, yes, that's a great question. That's a great question. And, 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 and uh, I will say that like, you know, this could be like its own, you know, college class we could teach about that. But instead, I will say that yes, all, you know, Chris is very, uh, and was very interested in, you know, sort of unilateral like power and how um, that would be represented by Superman and or Batman and that on a local level or on a like global level, like the two of them represent, um, you know, kind of two tips of the spear in those two different arenas and how on a micro level, Batman is sort of affecting policy on the streets, a lot of street level and Superman can be affecting policy on a global level. And like, what are those tools? Even just like subtly in like, if you're looking at the, I mean, maybe it's not that subtle, uh, but like if you're looking at the protests against Superman outside the Capitol, there's like one of them has like a drone, you know, like on a stick because we were saying, you know, it's that, it's that level of um, sort of, how do you take an icon like Superman and superimpose those powers over whatever, you know, the implications are of someone who's able to say manipulate uh, world events in the way that he could, and even in our story, he's not really doing it to that level. But certainly, um, there are forces around him that easily can take what he does and shape it in a way that, when it gets to the public, it's sort of something else. And yeah, and that's obviously a thing that, um, unless you're naive could be happening in the real world every day. So that was really a thing we talked about all the time and with many examples um, that, uh, you know, when you look at the movie, you can really see how it applied to the time we made it. And, and literally to, it, it, it really does stand the test of time in the sense that it, you know, could have, we could have made this movie yesterday. It still has the same impact. Anyway, so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, a white shirt in the middle, all the way up top there. Make sure tone. Very high hand rate. There. Yes, that was very <laughs> caught my eye. Oh, no, not my eye. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Zach, and everyone for putting this on this weekend. Uh, Thanks for being here, you guys. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, a lot, not all of superhero movies and comic book style films in the last decade or so. It really shied away from showing, I think, real violence, whether it's towards humanity or even towards the villains. Uh, there's almost an aversion to showing something brutal or something that makes you feel small and helpless, kind of like what we see with Lex. You know, even your heroes might have to make giant sacrifices that can go against those moral compasses, be it killing or letting someone die. But what is it that you found that you wanted to explore in showing what I think is the reality of what these gods and demons can do in our world and the stakes for which they fight? because their actions on our half uh, 
I think feel so much more impactful when you see them succeeding and when you see everything that they're all capable of. Wow, okay. Um, I guess, you know, you know to me, um, and, and you know, I'm a fan of, of these characters, so, you know, to me, to challenge them is really my responsibility in some ways, you know? Um, I, I do not, it's not my intention to, you know, tear them down. It's my intention to, like, try and understand them and their relevance, you know? If the, if you, the way you show them, whether it be vulnerable, or whether it be confused, and whether it be, or whether it be like questioning the why of their existence, those are all things that as they are challenged by those things and or overcome those things, they become sort of, you lock them in as iconographic or as important, I guess, you know? And it's, the only, it's, it's only by challenging the, them as icons that you end up with the real hero in the end, you know? And so that was really, that was the thesis that I had given myself as far as how these characters would be portrayed. That I would deconstruct them, but in an attempt to make them, you know, put them on a journey that sets them as what we believe they are, you know, or can be. So that was kind of, I don't know if that answers the question, but that's, that's the why of it to me. I love this man right here. No, right in front there. Yeah. Do you get a microphone? They're coming to you. They're coming. Here it comes. Getting a good workout. Yeah. Over there. Like how you keep picking opposite hands. Yeah, that's cool. Right in the corner. In the front. Now run there. Outside. Oh, nice. Hi, everybody. Online. Zach, thank you for all your movies. Big fan. Thank you. Um, Thanks for coming out. Yeah. Thank you. Um, in this film, uh, we see Diana in a picture in 1918 uh, with Steve and her crew, which we eventually see in Wonder Woman. A couple of years ago, you posted a picture of Wonder Woman 1854, oh. and also a storyline from Stephen Burkman, I believe. He shot the Stephen shot it, yep. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Yay, Stephen Burkman! Also our center alumni and teacher. Oh, okay. awesome. Um, <laughs> what's unique about that photo is um, we see a lot of warriors from different cultures being represented. And for me, though it didn't maybe pan out because of whatever may have happened the past 10 years, um, saw a sick warrior right next yeah. to her right shoulder. And uh, I wanted to say thank you for including me at that level because um, yes. uh, you know, besides you know, my people as you know taxi drivers or uh, you know, <laughs> I really really like that you showed off um, even though it's very you know small it meant a lot to me uh, as a fan I really want to know how would have that storyline panned out. Um, if you can shed some light, I know it's crazy. The idea, more. I don't know if I've talked about, have I talked about this? I maybe, I don't know. The idea of it was that um, in those days, you know, because Diana was searching for the god of war, searching for Ares around the world, she would have gone to, in her sort of quest to find him, she ended up going to all the hot spots where all these conflicts were in the world. And then in those conflicts, looking for Ares, she would come across some amazing warrior on the battlefield that she would say, hey, join my, I'm looking for this god of war. I need, you know, a team to help me. And that's kind, that was the basic concept behind who all those guys were. And that they saw her on the battlefield and she was so insanely powerful that they were like, yeah, I guess in service of this goddess, like that, you know, is, is even more powerful than like the surface of my country or whatever I'm doing, whatever political war I'm in, this, this goddess asking me to join her is like, that's like quite an honor. And so that's why when we see her in Crimea, she's ended up with um, those cats that are with her from like, you know, her journey around the world. <laughs> Day that you heard Zimmer's theme for Wonder Woman. Oh yeah, yeah. I remember being down in uh, in his little uh, his crazy studio, which is amazing down in Santa Monica. It's kind of like a I don't know. It's kind of like a cool I don't know what. It's like a it has a lot of bookshelves and like 
like sculptures in it. it looks a little bit like the Phantom of the Opera <laughs> set up in the middle. You're kind of on these old sofas. It's really cool. It's like, and then he was like, okay, here we go. This is it. Uh, what do you like? I think he kind of sprung it on me. Like he, he, he said, this is going to be, I think this is a cool way to introduce Wonder Woman. And he played it and we were literally, it's exactly as it is. And it just blew us away. And I remember just going like, wow, because we did talk about it being like this tribal kind of like visceral, like instead of, you know, as a way to introduce Wonder Woman, I think a lot of people thought, or you could think about it in a lot of different ways. And that was kind of a surprise sound for her, but totally fits her. Um, and it's a thing that's endured, I think, with her over the movies oh, a yeah. little bit. Sure. And, um, you know, I think that just is a testament to how sort of unique and exciting it was. And, and I, well, clearly, I loved it. So. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. All right. Let's see. What do we got? Um, let's go. Uh, this guy right here with the beer. And let's get other questions for the panelists, too, as well. Visual yeah. effects questions, stunt questions. Stunt visual effects. No, I'm good. Start on. Yeah. 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 Start on. Yeah. 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 So I know it was um, hinted essentially that Kara was uh, one of the survivors from the ship with the open pod and the skeleton. Sure. I was just curious <laughs> when you were going to actually bring her in if you had any you know, thought of bringing her into one of the later movies. No, tell the real story. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, tell the real story. Woo! the studio at the time. Turn off the cameras. <laughs> or the DJ say it. Do you mean about like where that guy was or where that person went? So remember we we like the idea that uh yeah, you yeah. know what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well like you know it's this whole thing with like Ares and Zeus. The gods and Ares and Zeus yeah. and whether or not like Zeus was really possibly a Kryptonian. Yes. And that oh. and that so that Wonder Woman's powers, anyway, you can sort of see where that's going. You know? Because, you know, the whole thing of like whether or not magic and the gods, you know, there's a version where like, okay, that's cool, I guess. But like, you know, there's also the more sort of scientific kind of, you know, you have like a mythology built up of like, why, where do gods come from? Like, what is that about, you know? And so anyway, it was, we had played around with that quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> and Ares was the one that caused the scout ship to crash yeah. and be in the ice. Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah. What? yeah. He killed his crew. Yeah. Yeah. So you can't just throw that out. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? I just did. More details. Come on, DJ. They ask some questions for you. We have a lot of conversations. <laughs> That's uh, we do. Sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't you glad DJ came and stuff like that? <laughs> Larry might have said that too. <laughs> All right, other questions. Uh, Batman right there had his hand up first. Yes. You Batman? Said yes. Oh, Batman. That, Batman had his Batman. hand up first. Batman's, Batman's right over there. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, hey, Zach. Batman has had a question. My brother and I came out from New Jersey for this. Cool. Woo! Where in Jersey? Uh, Verona by Montclair. Okay, yeah. 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 Uh, I'm going to ask you something I've been wondering about since the first Batman vs. Superman trailer. Oh. Um, one of the elements that you introduced in that trailer was the dead Robin suit in the Batcave. Robin's death at the hands of the Joker was teased again in Suicide Squad and your version of Justice League, but was never shown on screen. What were the events leading up to and resulting in Robin's death in your universe? I'll do a brief. I'll do a brief one because I think that that's still something that would be cool for people to see at some point. I don't know when or ever. So I don't want to ruin it. It may never happen, but yeah, nice. Um, but uh, he thought the Justice League wouldn't happen. Yeah, that's so. true. <laughs> So suffice it to say that, like, you know, to hurt 
Batman, obviously, you know, he has, at that point, he had, his real vulnerability was, was Robin, right? And so I think that what's obvious is that um, the Joker uh, understood that, right? Um, and all I'll say is that, you know, he's, I think I've talked about this a little bit, haven't I? That, you know, he's, he clearly he, he blew him up, or it looks like he burned, scorched him. Um, I think beyond that, I really don't want to say the actual circumstances because I feel like it's a spoiler for maybe a thing that will never need to be spoiled, but we should wait to see, don't you think, a little bit. Yeah. Sure. It might be a spoiler for something that we might get to see at some point in the in the near future at some point. But in the nightmare sequence of, of Justice League, it's made very clear that Batman had to bring Joker along because he was going to be important somehow. Right. Um, how might he be important to the mission they're trying to complete? Our theory is that he's the one that knows where the kryptonite, what shards of kryptonite exist. He has that information. And so he's being carried, so he's basically made a deal with Batman, don't kill me and I'll show you, I'll get you a tool to fight Superman. And so he's kind of stuck with him in that way. And so like if he kills him or gets rid of him, then he's screwed himself. So who's gonna give him the reach around? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is right. true. There's a couple other people there. Batman, over here, Batman. <laughs> First of all, I just want to preface and say that um, as someone who lost a stepbrother to suicide, um, this entire weekend means a lot to me. So I want to thank all of you for recommending your creativity to a powerful movement. I know that the Batman, Superman, Batman v Superman team up movie has been in creative development for like, it was in creative development for a long time. And I just wondered if there were any initial ideas that all you guys had that the studio kind of rejected or kind of like mandated that you do not do. And um, if there was anything that you could share. About How long you got? The one that yeah. you saw. <laughs> <laughs> characters was there anything that maybe you're like okay let's put a pin in that and maybe we'll just beat them down and we'll just you know have the fans rally and yeah the one that you saw <laughs> yeah I mean like in a lot of ways yeah I mean that was the thing that Chris and I when Chris and I sort of wrote the movie or talked about this version of the movie it was not the version of the movie necessarily that the studio was like it was not like a big fun romp where those two are like you know <laughs> just you can imagine i think that there's a version like you know i'm sure the version of the movie that's on the poster in i am legend is more of the movie whatever that movie was going to be was probably the movie that they wanted you know what i mean <laughs> So I don't know. <laughs> I don't have that script, but that was it. But you can just tell by the poster that it seemed more fun. But not epic, like you. But not epic. Yeah. yeah. But clearly, I bet there's a lot of like, there was a lot of zingers in it, like a lot of they were zinging each other the whole time. They probably hurt each other more with zingers than actual blows. <laughs> You know? Like there was comments about like, why is your underwear on the outside of his yeah. pants? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, why is yours? <laughs> Zach, this I is an alien <laughs> uniform. <laughs> remember when we were, you kept coming back to me saying we have to, the the MPA wants us to like, take. remember we couldn't do the blood splat on the wall. Yes. Right from the crate, which is yeah. the one that you like. But now You guys the saw the blood yeah. on the wall. But but we kept taking all those things out and still getting an R rating, and then you got that note from them. Well, we just think that 
Batman's too mean to Superman. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, can you really comment on that? You yeah, I didn't, I didn't think that was like in your domain. Yeah. <laughs> like to just so not weird. like the idea yeah. of them fighting, and so now it's R. <laughs> that was, yeah. Even the MPAA. Yeah, they were yeah. just like, we think it's rude that they're fighting. Yeah. And I was like, I'm sorry, it's yeah. in the title. Like, <laughs> is that in your list? Yeah. That's so weird. You know, it's an R rating? No, yeah, it's an NC-17, yeah. this is an X. Yeah. Yeah. Cut that part out. out. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> is there any way you could cut them fighting out? That'd be cool. How would they just team up and like each other? Yeah, that's it. That's what they what want. What about that? Violence, language, and a mean superhero. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the reasons for your rating. And, and, and yeah, and can't they just like, you know, maybe they like argue at the first act, but then they shake hands and then like they fight the bad guy together. I go, well, they kind of fight the bad guy together at the end. Yeah. Didn't you see that? And they're like, no, oh, there was a lot of fighting before that. <laughs> um, and DJ, when I put the question out uh, to Twitter followers about something they wanted to know about this film, there was a lot of uh, talk about uh, Metalo. Uh, and sketches that were uh, potentially out there for that character oh, yeah. included? Was that, was that going way, way back? Yeah. That was going way, way back. Yeah, yeah, we actually did a, uh, like a previous test, remember? We actually modeled him and everything. Yeah, because you, you had a design for that. Right? So we, we built that and had him like by the Washington Monument and that whole thing. Yeah, yeah. That didn't make it. Another one of those things. Well, because it was a... You know, that I was mean, Scoot's character. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, that's what Scoot, Scoot well, McNary was yeah, going to be. Yeah, character. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that was a that whole was, different yeah. movie. That, yeah, it was a completely that, yeah. different weirdo movie that yeah. changed. Yeah. All right, anything else out here? Yes, this one right over here. Yes. Um, See, they're coming. Okay. Oh, right. microphone. All right. Microphone, guys. Yeah! yeah. Jack, uh, thank you for all the verisimilitude you put in this movie. Uh, great. Um, my favorite thing uh, about your filmography is uh, the way you do semiotics. Uh, I know you have to communicate that to uh, your crew, but how much and to what depth do you communicate that to uh, your cast? Okay, in what sense? Uh, uh, like, well, here's what we're doing with this scene that's a little bit beyond the surface. Oh, yeah. Well, I think in the process of making the movie, when you first, you meet with the actors and talk about what the movie is, and, you know, the script, by the way, um, is, is always like a jumping off point, and it's always, there's always subtext in the way the script is written anyway. Um, and then when I go through the drawings with them, there's always that next sort of layer, and then it's the discussions about what they would bring and what, and how free they are to kind of keep digging. And I always try to encourage them to go. There's no, like, I don't think, oh, that's too much. Like, you're making it too complicated. Like, that's not, that's not a thing. You can always, there's always, the thing about making a movie is you can always take things out. It's not like, it's easy to like, to, to trim back um, a concept or, or like a point of view. And, but it's really, you can't create that. In, in the editorial process. You can't say, oh, it'd be cool if there was more depth to this moment. Because, uh, you know, that's not, it was never there. But it's easy to take it out. And so um, I don't mean to overshoot, but I tend to a little bit. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I always yeah. feel like I've never, like I've barely got enough footage. <laughs> I always feel like that. Yeah, I always feel like that. I literally am like, there's no way the scene we can make it with those small amount of shots. Though. Yeah, <laughs> never is. Because I'm doing no reshoots, so. That's yeah. <laughs> Not by us anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go, I'm happy to say. <laughs> I just want to really want to know that. follow up on that, that I've seen Zach I mean, privy to conversations that where he's actually had to lean in on an actor or actress to try and get them to 
to go there again, wanting to go, wanting to go beyond, and then he can reel it back. So if anything, he goes too far, which is, <laughs> which is how you know how to bring it back to where it needs to be. So how come you didn't let the deep crowder do a spin kick? Oh yeah! Oh. Look at that. <laughs> it was too showy for the for the moment, and what what? It's a great question. Uh, too showy for what the moment was. Uh, it was more real world. We need to kill this guy. So, and Latif could do that with a spin kick. Yeah, but, uh, but for the overall tone, it didn't. It didn't. Great question. There we go. Nice. All right, right up front there, black shirt, um, like two rows back from the middle. This one's from a Patrick Petopoulos. Yes. I mainly know your work for stuff like Godzilla and Underworld. So what's the difference between doing stuff like monsters and doing superheroes? And superheroes? Yes. What's the difference between doing like monsters There's and no superheroes? When it's <laughs> nice. There's no Did you get this one? Really? <laughs> <laughs> the internet needs it. <laughs> so um, you're asking me what's the difference between that and doing a superhero movie? I, you know, to me, it's the same. It's all about characters that define. They live in a world, and this world has to fit the character and vice mm -hmm. versa. I think one of the things I've always tried to do is to uh, to keep working on characters and creatures as well as the set for one reason, because I think they belong to the same thing. And it, it makes sense. There's a logic in the design. And uh, that's why I'm always interested in projects that bring those creatures or characters. In the case of, uh, in the case of uh, um, Batman, Superman, or uh, you know, um, all the characters that go around, I always have a little pass on it. And we look at it with Zach. It's not my job to necessarily design the creature, but bring some ideas on the table. And that's super important to me. I don't think I want to do films that don't have characters and, and creatures and things like that. This is kind of what I do. Uh, it makes the sets also very organic. You work, you think more organically than super, you know, like I said, you know, in this case, we have some very bold building. This was the Batman that Zach created. But on the whole, I like to bring organic into the world of the design, my design, and so that's why creature fits the same way. You design the same way, you design character, you design sets, it's not that far off to me. They all blend together at the end. Yeah, because think about the difference between yeah. sort of the sort of hard reality of the Batcave and then the super organic sort of deconstructed Wayne Manor. It's like, you know, crumbling above him and like and the tomb and the overgrown like grounds, which are really not sharp and hard, but like really kind of soft and forgotten. You know, and I think that that sort of contrast is really Look at the Batmobile for me it's not a car, it's like a, it's a creature. I always looked at it like that. That's why it's got wings. That's why it's got a chin. It's got a face, yeah. and uh, it, it's, it comes alive to me if it's something like that. I just couldn't make a car. That's why we always the first design is always a sketch that comes out of nowhere. It's not like looking at other cars to start designing. We do the first thing always a small. You know the Batmobile. I keep saying this, but the first time I met you and I went directly to a Starbucks and started to sketch a Batmobile. The first thing I did, because I felt this is where everything was for me in my world of design. Is that to create you went one to Starbucks and did that? I did. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was so anxious. That was the first place I could see. Right there. It was the only place open. Yeah. yeah. So I picture you like I wanted to go to a bar with like a fine line. <laughs> like, yeah, that's Bro, awesome. Like, studio, man. <laughs> I went to Provence. So, yeah. <laughs> Seriously, that's the best thing I've heard. No, it's mind. Starbucks, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> that's the one. Yes. So yeah. So that's it. That's the that's the answer. Yeah. <laughs> This is unfortunately going to be our last question for the day, and I'm going to go to that person right there in the middle in the white shirt with their hand up raised. Yes. That's you. That's you, right? Yeah. Don't turn around, you. Stand up and a mic will come to you. Nice. <laughs> Stand up and a mic will come to you. Wow. Cool. So, it's kind of like a Snyderverse question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, like, I saw Watchmen, I loved it. Casting was perfect. Casting for Justice League, Bound for Superman, perfect. Um, like, I don't know if you're familiar with Doomsday Clock, but um, I was wondering if that was like in your vision or like what you think of it, and, like was that ever gonna like come to like fruition eventually in the future? Please no. Wait. <laughs> the Doomsday Clock. Doomsday Clock. It, it was like the crossover between Watchmen characters. Yeah, and, was that the Jeff Johns? Yeah, John? yeah. Jeff probably. yeah, probably not. Yeah. <laughs> Ah. <laughs> what?
like I said, like I said, probably not. No way. We should end on a more positive. That's all right. A quick one. Quick one. We should have just gone to the lobby. Right here. Quick, 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 so, uh, it, it's been said your work print of BBS was another hour longer. What is a sequence or oh something God. that you have? Okay, yeah, we were talking seen? about it. I think I talked about it a little on the live stream. There's a scene, and we shot it. I can't, I can't even barely remember it. It's the scene where, remember where Clark went down to the the house, the room below, the apartment below to fix the leak oh, yeah. in the ceiling yeah, yeah, from them spilling the water out of the bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like, the, it was Bukowski, uh, it was me, she, we, we called her Mrs. Yeah. Bukowski, Mrs. Bukowski yeah. cause she lived below and she was like always banging her like, uh, her broom on the roof and be like, hey, yeah. what's going on up there? Yeah. <laughs> the guys are making a lot of noise. <laughs> That was, that was an hour? Yeah. Well, it was, but it was like a lot of shooting. I remember. Yeah, but, yeah, so, you know, there was Bukowski, the, 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 the nosy neighbor <laughs> who lived below the, you know, Lois and uh, Clark. You know, who was angry that the water kept spilling things. out of the tub every night. <laughs> coming, into their, coming into their bedroom or whatever, coming into their bathroom. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, we have to wrap there because not everything gonna, made it into that the movie. Oh my God, we got to she see turned Batman. out to be a superhero too. No, <laughs> she, wasn't. She, was, she was nobody. Uh, we want to thank everyone for coming out to watch Batman vs Superman. Thank you guys. Oh, the on the panel tomorrow too <laughs> and winner number one is 102794 uh -oh. <laughs> someone's got it so i'm gonna i'm gonna leave that there was it you one of the openings there you go there you go